Commodore of the Single-Handed Sailing Society. Pat is an amateur naval historian. And he spent much of the lockdown researching ghost ships. <laughs> He's excited to share the latest ghost news. Garland Sloan, our second speaker, was aboard a ship that did go down, the USS Benevolence. And we are very lucky to hear his first-hand account of a mass man overboard. Now, we are very preoccupied with man overboards here at the club, so we rarely hear stories like this. So, so keep your ears peeled. I guarantee you their stories of ghosts and ghost survivors will move you. Before they begin, please make a note to say Thursday, March 3rd, a month from now, geologist and author William Glassley will bring, to a, bring us virtually to Greenland, where he studies land that has been covered with ice for millennia. No one has walked on this land, and he is walking on it. His book, A Wilder Time, published a number of, a few years ago, which I read at the time, is beautifully and magically written. It's not a geology textbook. It is mystical, magical, and deserving of its many rewards. Oh, awards. No, awards. So that's Thursday, March 3rd. So, let me tell you, it's a grand night for ghost ships. <laughs> You'll soon find out why. But first, I have to talk a little bit. Years ago, I visited the new exploratory, and I saw a map of all the ships that were aground in the bay. As a mapophile, is that a word? <laughs> it is now. Of course, I wanted to buy the map, but it wasn't for sale. Now that the San Francisco Maritime National Historic Park Association has revised the map, you will be surprised, and I think Pat may well show it, uh, you will be surprised by the prevalence and presence of these ghost ships. Remember I said it's a grand night for ghost ships. Just this morning on the news, I heard, maybe some of you did too, that Australian maritime archaeologists believe they have identified the remains of one of the most important ships in the South Pacific maritime history, Captain Cook's HMS Endeavour. It was scuttled in the U.S. somewhere more than 200 years ago. They believe, the Australians, that they have definitively identified the, the ship in Newport Harbor, Rhode Island. Okay, now, the Rhode Island Mar Maritime Archaeology Project said, hold on, we're not so sure. <laughs> so we will have to wait for the resolution while they puzzle and figure it out. Anyway, that's cool. pretty cool news. Okay, so that's not all. We have a ghost in the room tonight. Some of you may have spotted it. One of the most famous San Francisco goat, goat ships. <laughs> ghost ships. The whaler Niantic has a long storied history in San Francisco even at one time known as the finest hotel in San Francisco. What is left of the Niantic is now buried several blocks from the waterfront and is designated a California historical landmark. Several years ago, a Corinthian member purchased this fragment over here to your right, which is a slice of the hull midships at the waterline of the Niantic. And that member gifted it to an esteemed former Commodore of our club. And uh, we are lucky enough to have it here with us tonight. So check that out for old two to three hundred year old shipbuilding. So perhaps Pat will tell us more about the Niantic. I think he will. Which in my opinion is a beautiful name for a ghost. So perhaps ghost ships are not really ghosts after all. Maybe they are always with us if we slow down to notice. 
Pat and Garland will help us slow down tonight. Please give a warm welcome to Pat and Garland. San Francisco. Well, that's, um, that got loud suddenly. I, turn, I have turned my hearing aid down. Thank you. <laughs> Most are hidden from view, but some of them are not. This evening, I'm going to describe four categories of uh, three categories rather of those ghost ships that continue to sail, and then the fourth part of the lecture will be uh, Garland describing his experience uh, aboard USS Benevolence, Benevolence uh, the only hospital ship, U.S. hospital ship, to uh, be lost in all of the history of uh, hospital ships. And ironically, three miles off Land's End. We're gonna start There, there's the uh, list of what we're going to do. We're going to start. We're going to start with steam schooners. Steam schooners in the late 19th and early part of the 20th century was the workhorse of the coast. There were about 240 constructed, and mostly they were used to haul redwood lumber down from uh, dog hole ports, inlets uh, along the Cal Northern California coast to rebuild San Francisco after it burned every time. Uh, some of them went as far as Long Beach carrying lumber to Southern California. Uh, a lot of the early part of American Los Angeles was built out of North Coast Redwood. So we're going to start with a short history of uh, one steam scooter, uh, the SS Seafoam. Seafoam was constructed in 1905 at Aberdeen, Washington. Uh, 
uh, she was 339 gross tons, had a 500 horsepower compound steam engine, and could carry about 800,000 board feet of lumber in the hold and on deck. And when we talk about in the hold with the steam scooter and lumber, we're talking about hand loading each piece of lumber into the ship uh, in such a way that it was locked together and essentially you ended up with a solid block of wood uh, rather than a uh, ship with cargo. Seafoam also had cabins on the rear of the ship, after the ship, for passengers, complete with a day room and a galley, and uh, she carried passengers from those small ports to and from uh, San Francisco. San Francisco, uh, San Seafoam continued these weekly, almost weekly trips between San Francisco and those small ports until February 23, 1931, when in heavy fog she foundered at Point Arena with a full cargo of lumber. The crew and passengers were rescued by the Point Arena Coast Guard Station, and because the ship was that essential block of wood, it didn't sink, rather it drifted ashore, the lumber was recovered and the ship was broken up, machinery uh, recovered and brought back down and reinstalled in, a, in another ship. These are pictures of sea foam. This is a, a painting of sea foam. Uh, the fate of sea foam was the fate that many uh, of these team scooters suffered. But by the 1930s, the railroads and highways had punched their way through to many of the locations that had been served by the schooners, and they became, as they say across the pond, redundant. Uh, and many of them were laid up in Oakland Creek, which is now the Oakland Alameda Estuary. Some were sold in the Forest Ser uh, Forum Service, particularly Mexico, uh, and uh, others uh, were just simply burned on the mudflats uh, to recover the iron uh, in, their, in their fittings. So here is a manifest for uh, cargo for seafoam on one of her trips. By the way, the Kelly Museum House in Mendocino has many, many artifacts from seafoam. And just down the coast a bit, you can stay at the seafoam motel if you'd like to sleep aboard on a steam scooter, so to speak. Uh, and what you have here is, a, is an order list by citizens, probably from Mendocino, uh, that the captain took to San Francisco and gave to a broker in San Francisco who assembled, sort of like the Safeway people do now when you call in your order, uh, what you ordered and delivered it to the ship and it was taken back to, um, to you there. As I say, there were passengers uh, on aboard these ships, uh, and uh, there was no convenient dock for the passengers, so they boarded and uh, debarked in the same way that the lumber did, using the same tackle to uh, notice that the gentlemen uh, are standing, uh, allowing the ladies to sit uh, on their way. I'm not sure down or back, but on their way, one way or the other, to their trip uh, south. As I said, sea foam uh, came to grief at Point Arena, and here she is, uh, washed up on the beach, looking intact, except uh, badly broken up the keel and uh, the hull. And by uh, the next day or so, uh, this is what she looked like. As I said, all of her lumber was offloaded and uh, uh, the ship itself was broken up. Now, what happened to all of those extra ships that were up in the open creek? Well, uh, Captain Clark, Raymond Clark, who ran the, the Richmond uh, San Rafael Ferry, uh, the, one of those boats was the Charles Van Dam that ended its days in Sausalito as the Ark, uh, 
in the corner there as you enter. He also on the side ran a fishing business. He would rent you a dory and uh, sell you a bucket of bait and then using a launch drag you from the Richmond Harbor up to Point San Pablo which at that point before the refinery was there was a great place for fishing, uh, striped bass and sturgeon. Uh, he would leave you there and later in the day come back and pick you up uh, and drag you back to Richmond. Uh, of course, there were 25 or 30 others that were in, in a daisy chain behind you as you got towed. He thought it would be much more convenient to actually rent the boats at Point San Pablo. So he went over to Oakland Creek and he bought seven old steam scooters. He towed them around to uh, Point San Pablo. He sank them, forming two breakwaters. Uh, has anyone been out to Point San Pablo, to the little marina out there? Yeah. Uh, this is it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this is how it was created. Here's an aerial shot of uh, the uh, marina. Over the years, the uh, ships rotted away and uh, dirt and rock was brought in to, to fill up between them. But originally, uh, that's uh, what it looked like. Uh, here is uh, what it looked like in 1946. You can see that by, uh, there's still ships visible uh, in uh, breakwater. Uh, the San Pablo Yacht Club uh, was created, and this is its first home. Uh, the boats there, you see there, some of them are the uh, Yacht Club boats. Uh, here uh, is, oops, I'm, I'm jumping ahead here. I go back, yeah, well, I don't need to go back. Yeah, that, that's, so the next time you sail to Vallejo, uh, and you go by, and on your starboard side, you see some masts in behind Point San Pablo, they're not the steam scooters, they're the sailboats that are currently kind of landlocked in there. <laughs> uh, but you are sailing by uh, ghost ships that uh, have been there since 1938 and will, at least their bones, be there uh, until sometime who knows when. Uh, okay, now we come to the Wellesley. Wellesley was built at Prosper, Oregon, uh, and uh, again, about the same size as Seafoam. Uh, and in 1928, she was anchored in Sausalito's Rotten Row. I, I know it's hard to understand that Sausalito, if I'm not mistaken, one of the more expensive places in the world <laughs> to buy a piece of property, once had a Rotten Row. Uh, of old ships anchored off in Richardson's Bay, but there, there it was. Um, and the um, Roger Madden Sr. Uh, in 1941 uh, decided to build a downtown marina in Sausalito. Uh, short on funds, he remembered what Clark had done at Point San Pablo, so he brought in three ships and lined them up along the south end of what is now the downtown harbor in Sausalito uh, on the mud flat there and sank them. And they stayed uh, there for a couple of years. This is what they look like now. This is on your way out to the uh, restaurant. The, uh, what is that restaurant? I forget. Uh, the Spinnaker. Uh, the Spinnaker restaurant, yeah. yes. Uh, and uh, the Sausalito, the nascent Sausalito Yacht Club, the young guys who uh, didn't have to go off to war yet and, found, and founded the Sausalito Yacht Club, actually used uh, the state, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the room, uh, the uh, day room on one of the ships as their first uh, clubhouse. But, uh, in 1944, they had rotted and they were an eyesore. Uh, and the Sausalito, they were decided to burn them. And the Sausalito mayor, with a large crowd looking on, uh, torched the holes that were still remaining above the mud 
and everyone enjoyed the fire until the fire found one of the fuel tanks on one of the ships that had not been drained. After the explosion, the fire burned all night, and it being 1944, the authorities in San Francisco, and Oakland, and Richmond, and maybe El Viso, I don't know, became very concerned thinking that foreign saboteurs had snuck into Marin ship and blown up the place that was building ships by the ton uh, for the war effort. But it turned out that that wasn't the case. So, in Sausalito and in San Pablo, at the point, point San Pablo, you have... Uh, Doug will help me get back. You have ghost fleets. Uh, okay, thank you. Okay, now we come to the San Francisco ghost fleet. Uh, lots of pictures on the internet. You can you just enter here, go to San Francisco Bay, Gold Rush ships or something like that, and you'll come up with dozens and hundreds of pictures of ships that look a lot like this. There were uh, up to a thousand ships anchored in Yerba Buena Cove, which is now the business district of San Francisco. Would-be miners were crazy to get to gold country. And here's a cartoon of the day showing them coming by balloon, by rocket, by ship, uh, jumping into water, mad to get to San Francisco. The clipper ship had not yet been developed, and so instead, they uh, came, arrived in San Francisco in what were pretty old hulls that had been coastwise traders along the Atlantic coast or down into the Caribbean. Some of them had been transatlantic traders, uh, hastily converted into uh, ships with bunks and a galley to bring you around to San Francisco. It was easier, unbelievably, to spend six to nine months on a ship than it was to walk from the Missouri Mississippi River to San Francisco. It uh, wasn't necessarily safer, but it was uh, the way that many of about 40,000 of the 49ers arrived. In 1847, before gold, six trading ships called at San Francisco during the year. In August of 1849, 70 ships arrived in August. An estimated 3,600 people arrived in July of 1849. About half of them, about most of them, about 3,000 being Americans, others coming from Australia and New Zealand, and South America, and some even from Europe, uh, but they must already have been somewhere before they left Earth in order to get here by then. Uh, in other months during 1849 and 1850, similar numbers of ships and people, men mostly, arrived. Uh, when they got here, they immediately headed for gold country, and so did the crews from most of the ships, uh, because it was thought that it was easier to make more money digging gold than it was standing on a spar 100 feet in the air in a storm, I guess. Uh, well, what happens to all of these ships in the bay? Uh, first of all, they're old ships for the most part. They were purchased cheaply on the East Coast. They made the money back on the trip and probably a handsome profit so taking them back to the East Coast and then coming back another year and a half wasn't going to make anybody any money. So if the crew didn't abandon the ship, the owners did. Because they were now essentially worthless. Pictures. More pictures. A drawing by James Audubon, who happened to be out here um, doing birds, I guess, but he also drew a picture of San Francisco Bay. Uh, and then, of course, there were fires that burned the city uh, over and over again. 
One of the most famous ships, that, at least in our history, there's a fragment over on the table, was uh, Niantic. Niantic was a uh, <coughs> whaler that had been converted to a ship to bring passengers over around the Horn on. And she arrived in San Francisco and suffered the fate of all of those other ships, except that Niantic became a hotel. <laughs> <laughs> Frank Marriott, an English journalist, wrote as follows, The front of the city is extending rapidly into the sea as water lots are filled up with sand hills which steam excavators remove. This has left many of the old ships that a year ago were beached as storehouses in a curious position so that a stranger puzzles for some time to ascertain how the Apollo, ship on the left, and Niantic became perched in the middle of a street. Um, you can see that they've also, um, Niantic built a two-story hotel on top of the hull. The bottom was a store where you could buy what you might want to buy, and then you could stay in, one in the hotel. Uh, but in 1851, along with all of San Francisco and everything in sight, Niantic burned. There is the rudder and after part of the keel of Niantic, which you can see over in the Maritime Museum in San Francisco. And a fragment of it on the table over here. Um, when Niantic was uncovered, it was a gold mine of artifacts because what had been in the hull itself didn't burn. It just, everything fell on top of it and it got preserved by the mud and the um, debris that, that fell on top of it. The General Harrison joined Niantic in burning in 1851. She was launched in 1840. I sailed a pack of routes along the coast for nine years. Uh, in, eight, in August of 1849, she cleared Boston Harbor, rounded Cape Horn, and on February 3rd of 1850, count the months, arrived in San Francisco. It was seven months, but she did stop in several places in South America to put on provisions and fresh water, so it wasn't a non-stop trip. She was sold as a warehouse and then burned. The location of the General Harrison's hull was known, so when a new hotel was constructed at Clay and Battery Streets, the archaeologists were ready. Under the floor of the building that was being demolished in order to build a new hotel, uh, they came across the General Harrison, at least 81 feet of her. The aft 40 feet or under the foundation of the building next to it. Uh, you can see the size of the ship with the, the men there. Uh, it is said that as they power washed off the mud from the hull, the workers could smell ash and wine. <laughs> because the General Harrison as a store ship had a healthy supply of spirits on board when she burned. Uh, as a matter of fact, some of them, the ones, again, the ones deep in the hull that, that didn't burn and survived stuff crashing down and there were bottles of wine and uh, other spirits that survived. Uh, my friend Doug, who helped me with the uh, setup tonight, is a docent over at the Maritime Museum and he says that there are uh, warehouses with a million or more. How many? Four. Oh, with four million artifacts from the various ships that have been excavated in San Francisco itself. Um, another picture of the General Harrison being excavated. Here's a picture of what were called water lots. Water lots were parcels of land under water which were sold. 
You can see them outlined by the, by the framework. Uh, there was uh, at first a rush to fill, just the dump, particularly after the fire of 1851 when all the debris from the fire was dumped into the bay. But soon laws were passed that began to regulate that, uh, and it became difficult. However, if you owned a ship that sank or burned, then you would be allowed to fill uh, around that ship. Um, Let me go to the next one. Yeah. Here is Rome. Uh, Rome is the ship that arrived in 1850. Uh, and after sitting out there at anchor for a couple of years, Captain Fred Lawson bought the ship for $1,000, which was a healthy amount of money in the day. Uh, but Captain <clears throat> Lawson had a business. And he sold the ship to a Joseph Galloway who paid $5,000 for the ship. And so you ask, what the hell? There's, there's an old ship that's not going anywhere, and one day it's valued at $1,000, and the next day it's valued at $5,000. Whoa, there's a catch. He also, as part of the deal, arranged for <coughs> Captain Lawson to drag the ship up against the shoreline, and then it conveniently sank. <laughs> right at a place where, uh, where Galloway owned a water lot. <laughs> the saloon that uh, Galloway built on top of the sunken hull and now Phil was one of those places where you could buy um, ale along the Embarcadero, or what became the Embarcadero. Well, what became of Rome? We're talking about ghost ships. Uh, you can see where the Justin Herman Plaza is there. You can see where the, oh, by the way, the, uh, the ships you'll see in a moment, many of the ships that sank in, or are still under the water, under the land in San Francisco Bay, are conveniently aligned with the streets. Uh, it isn't a random sinking, they, they, they happen just coincidentally to be aligned with the streets. Uh, and Rome is there. In 1994, when they were extending Muni uh, along the Embarcadero to Folsom Street, uh, they were digging and all of a sudden they came across wood. And uh, under San Francisco, when you become, when you're digging, and you, the archaeologists appeared immediately. <laughs> and digging stopped. Uh, and what they uncovered was uh, the forward part of Rome. They recovered what they could, but the decision was made to uh, just cover it over and bore through it. So you can see that the left tunnel of the Muni's subway goes right through the ship. So the next time you ride Muni, and you're down by the Justin Herman Plaza, uh, look out the window and see if you see any rotten timbers sticking out of the mud, uh, or something like that. The third, the last ship is uh, uh, Candace. And Candace uh, was uncovered when they were putting up another, another hotel. And the story of Candace is one of wreckers. Uh, uh, Captain Hare was a wrecker. He bought ships, he broke them up. He sold the lumber that he got out of it for building. He sold uh, the iron, nails, bolts, whatever they were for reconstruction. He sold the winches to miners in the hills. Uh, he sold the canvas to make, uh, the, from the sails to make tents and clothes. Uh, and uh, when he finished with the hull, he just sort of left it. <laughs> and so they uncovered the, uh, the hull of the, of the canvas here. Uh, a map? A map showing uh, the position of about 40 ships. And you will notice how they align with the streets. And if you're in the business district of San Francisco, uh, you'll find uh, here a, a bronze plaque with the location of ships. And you'll find in the street a plaque with says, under this spot where you're standing is one of these ships. So they're the ones that they know about. 
they're, they're documented. And that's the ghost fleet that sails the financial district. <laughs> uh, and there's sort of an irony there because uh, what is now the financial district of San Francisco started out as a financial adventure. Uh, it, there's a, I think there's a lovely irony there. Now we come to um, naval ships and uh, go through this very quickly. The first ship is um, a tugboat, USS Conestoga, uh, which came to San Francisco in 1920 on its way to Samoa, where it was going to be uh, a yard boat in uh, Tug and Samoa. It left uh, San Francisco in 1921, towing a barge of coal, headed for Honolulu for the stop for a stop, and then on to, and it never got to Honolulu. Uh, the Navy gave it a month, and then began to search. They thought the boat had gotten close to Hawaii, so they sent her, even though a few life jackets with Conestoga on them, washed up along the Montero coastline, the Navy dismissed them as saying, well, they just got washed off the boat uh, in, the, in the storm. They, and so they used every um, available boat and airplane of the day to search the Hawaiian Islands. Uh, and they finally ran out of um, areas of search and gave up. Here is the crew of the Conestoga. Here is the projected trip from Merrill Island to Pearl Harbor. The other line down at the bottom is its route from through the Panama Canal up the coast. And without giving the secret away, the top inset shows the location of Calistoga, about just a few miles south of the Southeast Farinon Islands. But while they were searching, one of the more bizarre episodes in American submarine history uh, occurred, and that is that the R-14 ship uh, submarines of the day, which are so-called boats, you know, didn't have names, they had numbers. Uh, and R-14 was sent out to search, but a couple of hundred miles away from Hilo, uh, she lost all of her electrical power, period couldn't get the engine started, couldn't use the radio, just no electricity, no electrical power whatsoever. R16 became the, R14 rather, became the only submarine sailboat <laughs> in history. <laughs> That's a sail. They used uh, battery covers, they use blankets, they use sheets, sewn together, hung on the forward torpedo uh, um, um, winch and the periscope to sail the boat from where it was into Hilo. The young guys on the boat who look about 16 don't look too unhappy about it, but that's uh, history. Uh, here is Conestoga today. And to prove it's there, they sent down an ROV, and the top picture shows you the deck gun that was installed when it was built. And down at the bottom, you see that same deck gun uh, today, or at least 10 years ago. The next ship is USS Thompson, uh, DD-305, built at uh, the Union Iron Works in San Francisco, laid down uh, designed and fight in World War II, or one rather, but it didn't uh, make it until, it didn't get commissioned until 1920, a little late. It spent the next 10 years uh, on the Pacific coast and over to Hawaii and back as a, as a uh, training ship. Here it's laying down a smoke screen in pre-radar days to mask the warships on the other side. Uh, it was at the Point Honda disaster when 11 destroyers left San Francisco on a fast cruise maneuver, headed for San Diego, and in the fog, decided to turn into the Santa Barbara Channel, 
a, a little early. Uh, and because, uh, because Thompson was near the rear of the fleet, it was alerted to the fact that turning left wasn't a good idea and survived. These are, these are the destroyers who get turned. And then in 1930, 1930, the United States signed a treaty with all of the naval powers of the world limiting tonnage. And one of the things that the Navy decided to do was to get rid of a whole bunch of force stack destroyers, which essentially had become obsolete the day they were launched. Uh, and so Thompson here at 305 is up in Narrow Island being dismantled. You can see that the, the deck house is partly gone, the guns are gone, but wait a minute, something happened. An entrepreneur bought the Hulk, towed it to Redwood City, where during the 1930s it became a bar and dance hall, <laughs> uh, anchored off of, of Redwood City. And then in 1941, when the United States went to war, it needed to train aviators to drop bombs. And so it bought Thompson back and towed it out into the mudflats off of Redwood City, and it became a bomb target. I have one of those bombs. I want you to, I'm going to pass it around, but I want you to be very careful because it, it could hurt someone badly. It, it weighs about three pounds, and if you drop it on your toe, <laughs> break it. It has a hole in the middle, a 10 gauge flare, which inserted in the hall, hole. On the top, there was a wire mechanism, which is gone from the bomb, that had the detonator in it. Eight of these were loaded in a tube under a fighter dive bomber, and the pilot trainee would aim for Thompson, push a button, and one of these would fall out. If it hit something solid, it ignited the flare, which puffed out the back. And an observer on a, in a small boat somewhere else with binoculars said, hit, and gave the pilot a check mark. If the plane went like this, and went like this, and there was no puff, the observer put a zero and said, put that guy in the Marine Corps, he needs to, he needs to walk up on the beach and something needs to fly. Uh, so, uh, Here's a, uh, a genuine, by the genuine U.S. government issue bomb. Oh, by the way, <coughs> any private pilots in here? Uh, they, they used what's left of Thompson as a guidepost for landing down at the, at the airfield down here. Here's the uh, M23 practice bomb. It says actual size, but you'll see when you get this one, it's a little bigger than the actual one. Uh, here is Thompson today. There's a barge that's been taken out and something next to it, but you can certainly see the shape of the hull. And it's a favorite place for uh, kayakers to come out from Redwood City. It's about two miles out. Uh, go on and investigate the drift. Okay, the last ship I'm going to talk to Fort Garland is USS uh, Henry Byrd. Uh, and Henry Byrd was built in Richmond as a troop transport. And in May of 1944, uh, it was returning to San Francisco from the South Pacific. Oh, by the way, it was set up for uh, 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 500 troops plus about 100 crew. It was returning from the South Pacific with 1,400 souls on board. Uh, a little overcrowded. I wonder where they all slept. Uh, and they were just approaching in the fog the Southeast Farallon Island. The uh, returning servicemen could smell the international settlement uh, in San Francisco. Women, booze, money that they hadn't been able to spend in the South Pacific. What, what, what could go wrong? They were so happy that someone dug up a record player and took it up to the foredeck. 
Someone in the galley had been saving the potato peels and had been fermenting uh, on the sly. So there was libation uh, and fog. And on the bridge, the captain failed to hear the horn on the southeast Farallon Island. They run in, they ran in ironically into the Trunken Brothers. If you know those, the rocks on the southwest corner of the island are called the Drunken Brothers. And uh, the Henry Bird broke up. Because they were sailors and because they had been drilled, they lowered the lifeboats and every man was saved uh, by 25 at a time by taking them off the ship and around to where the lighthouse keepers had their landing. The ship continued to break up. Here are some of the survivors come of being brought back on another naval ship. And in, in contrast to a picture you're going to see in a couple of minutes, notice that they're all wearing uniforms. Uh, the wreckage of the Berg is still there, not much more than the engine block, but on a day when it's really calm and you can't, you can't get close enough to see it really because of the restrictions with the wildlife preserve out there, but with binoculars, you can actually make out a square rock. Thank you. And the square rock is the engine block from the, from the ship. Okay, now I want to introduce my friend and my good friend, uh, a man I love dearly, uh, Garland Sloan, who's going to come up here Hi everybody, I'm Garland Sloan, and I want to talk to you a little this evening about the sinking of the hospital ship USS Benevolence, about just a few miles off the off Land's End. It was right in the middle of the shipping channel where she went down. But before that, I want to give you a little, a very brief history of when the ship was built. She was built in 1944, not as a hospital ship, but as a merchant marine cargo ship. Lost in July of 44, and in the end of July of 1944, she was transferred to the Navy, who took on the job of changing her from a cargo ship into a hospital ship. On May 5th, 1945, she was launched as the USS Benevolence AH-13. And uh, had immediate orders to the Pacific. The Korean War had just started in June 1950. And uh, well, that, that, I'm jumping ahead a little bit. She, for the rest of World War II, she worked off the islands in the Pacific, taking aboard wounded, treating them and putting them either back, back on duty or put them in the hospital there to await some kind of transportation back to the mainland uh, United States. In 1947, she was decommissioned at Mare Island, California. And then the Korean War came along and in 19... 50 uh, sailors started coming on board to put her back into commission and turn her back into an active hospital ship to work off the coast of Korea. I was among those. I had joined the Navy in 1948, and uh, at that time I was ready, I thought, for sea duty. So I went aboard the Benevolence early August 1950 along with um, a lot of other people. We had, at the time of sailing, we had 19 doctors, 15 nurses, and 150 hospital corpsmen. 
we, uh, we were all on board that, that day. It was, it was the day we were returning from our final shakedown cruise on 25 August 1915, when in the dense fog where you couldn't see anywhere, another ship came out of the out of nowhere and uh, rammed our ship on the port side just after the, the bow, tore a fifty by a five by fifty foot hole out of the side of our Netherlands. She took on water very fast. We had no water tank compartments. Our, it was a hospital. Our uh, doors in the, throughout the ship were just doors, like, like, like the doors in this building. So when the water came in, it forced its way very quickly throughout the ship. There, was, there were several of us in the mess hall eating our evening meal. And this terrible crash happened, <clears throat> and our, our trays and anything else that was loose went into the, into the air. We had no idea what had happened. But uh, almost immediately, the order came over the speaker system. All hands prepared to abandon ship. My buddy Horton and I, along with all the others, made it up the ladder out of the mess hall onto the uh, top deck. Horton and I found the found a lap jacket watch locker. And we had nobody had been issued lap jackets yet. So we found this locker full of old World War II K-pop life jackets. Big, cumbersome, heavy. And uh, we Horton and I stood in the door <coughs> of that locker and as people passed by we handed life jackets to everybody. When the crowd went down, like just about all the people who had passed, <clears throat> Orton and I each grabbed a life jacket and headed out to the, to the open air. By that time, the, the ship had listed far enough to the port that we were able to walk on the side as she was laying there, laying in the water. We walked up there and sat down on the side, just sort of relaxing and looking around, looking at nothing. We couldn't see anything but fog. We, we couldn't see any land. We didn't see any lights. We had no idea where we were. And we sat there hoping that some boat would come by and pick us up. <clears throat> and and uh, we had been there quite a long time. I kind of lost track of exactly how much time. But we, uh, suddenly, the, uh, what I later learned was the starboard stabilizer came up out of the water. And I thought that was the keel. And I turned to Orton and I said, hey, Orton, we better get the hell out of here. So we cinched up our lap jackets. Uh, I took my white hat and folded it, put it under my chopper. Took my shoes off, tied the strings together, and hung them around my neck. Now, to this day, I have no idea what the thought process was. <laughs> I didn't think I was going to have something to do with those shoes. <laughs> but it didn't matter. I lost it the first hundred yards anyway. We did that, made our preparations, and walked off into that ice water. If you've ever been in it, you know what I'm talking about. And we had just regular clothes on. Wetsuit or anything. So we, yet with a, the primary objective was to get away from the ship as far and as fast uh, as we could. So we swam as hard as we could swim with that life jacket. And when we were out, maybe a thousand yards, quite a ways from the ship, we heard somebody yelling behind us. And we turned to see if they were trying to call us back or what, what was going on. <clears throat> well, we quickly saw that one of, our, one of our shipmates was in the water and he was sort of falling out of his life jacket. He 
would go under, he would come up and yell out, go under, come up and yell. So we turned around and beat it back to where he was as fast, again, as fast, as fast as we could swim with those life jackets on. When we got there to, to his location, and we determined that the strap of the life jacket is supposed to be fastened under your crotch to hold the life jacket so you don't fall out of it. And it was unbuckled. So the two of us held him up and, and cut his seat belt, made his belt buckled. And the three of us swam again away from the ship as fast as we could. Throughout the night, we came across other, that sinking had taken place around six o'clock. I don't know exactly. But we, we, throughout the night, we met other people. We all uh, hooked on to each other the best way we could. Each of us holding the other one's shoulder while we swam with our right hands. And we all managed to stay afloat. And throughout, throughout the rest of the night, the person on my left was our Catholic chaplain, Father Rear. And uh, I was felt I felt pretty relieved at that. <laughs> like I was in good company. And so we swam and we rest a little, but you couldn't rest very much because that Cape Hawk lab check wouldn't do much. We swore that if you threw one in the water by itself, it would sink. So I wasn't doing a whole lot. But it was better than the alternative. Well, finally, when I don't know, I would, I would think it was sometime around midnight, a, a boat came alongside and cut his engines and stopped right alongside our little group. By that time, we had 14 people in our, in our little circle. He stopped there, put ladders over the side <clears throat> so that we could climb on board. And we all began to do that. And I found out pretty quickly this man was John Angelo Napoli. He was the owner and captain of this fishing vessel out of San Francisco. He had been on his way back after a hard day's work <clears throat> coming in to the go towards the Golden Gate. And a Coast Guard uh, boat had hailed him and told him about the sinking. And, and long before that, the ship had sunk completely. Told him about the sinking and gave him a location and told him that all hands were in the water. We were all swimming because the boat had listed so rapidly that the lifeboats could pick it had fallen over and got tangled up with all the lines and such. And nobody had it, they, they couldn't be launched. So everybody swam. At that point, he, John Napoli turned around, headed for the location where, where we should have been. And when he got where he thought we would be, uh, he found nobody there. He, didn't, he ran around, looked on, on the ocean, and didn't find any people. There was a westerly, westerly current at that time. And he deduced that we must have been washed farther out to sea. So he headed in that direction, and that's where we were. And he, my little group of 14 was his first group to start <coughs> pick up. He picked up a total of 70 people wow. that night. That little fishing boat was riding very low in the water. <laughs> and with those 70 people on board, he, he took us back to where uh, the, look of, the Mary Lookalback was the ship that had hit us, and she was anchored there, sitting, waiting. She had not known that we had sunk, that the benevolence had sunk. We on the benevolence didn't know she was there. So we swam in the opposite direction, actually, from where that ship was. But he took us there, and with lines and pulleys and stretchers, they got all of us onto that ship, up onto the weather deck. Uh, John Napoli's boat suffered quite a lot of damage to the bow during that process, because it was 
lying in against the side of that ship. John himself suffering some pretty serious back injuries. So he was actually never able to fish anymore for the rest of his life. And, but he did make it back to port with his boat, and the boat was repaired, and he sold it to somebody else. Well, on the Mary looking back, we were surprised they, they took us into these, what I call state rooms. They were, they were actually cruise quarters, and I found that on that merchant ship, two crewmen had one room. Now that's a little different from the Navy bunks that we were used to. There's, they're stacked about this high part, our part. If, you want, if you're in bed and you want to turn over, you slide out from under the bed, you turn over and get back in. <laughs> this was one room with two bunks, and it was assigned to two people. And we thought we were pretty good hands now. And uh, merchant ships, the same as Navy ships, have a regulation, had a regulation at that time, of no liquor on board. Nobody, ah. nobody could bring any liquor on board the ship. Well, suddenly, whiskey started showing up. <laughs> they brought Father Reardon and I one <laughs> bottle of whiskey between us. <laughs> <laughs> It did not last very long. <laughs> I, 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 I haven't been that cold again since that time. <laughs> Those seamen were very, very helpful to us. They ripped off our clothes. We couldn't just take them off. They wouldn't come off. They ripped off our clothes. They gave us their, some of their own dry clothes to put on. I had a pair of Levi's that hit me about mid-calf. <laughs> And uh, I happily went on liberty that weekend with that. But uh, we made it in there and we were waiting around and sometime in the very early morning, uh, I, have, I really don't know what time, but like two or three o'clock in the morning, an army tug came, picked us up and took us in through the Golden Gate into what I had. My memory tells me it was Pier 32 <clears throat> that they like, dropped us off. The Red Cross was there with coffee and, and cigarettes, two very important features <laughs> after whiskey. <laughs> <laughs> they, they fed us well with the coffee and, and gave, gave each of us a pack of cigarettes. <laughs> and, and a little later, oh, quite a while later, I guess, uh, ambulances came and with a motorcycle police escort took us all across the bay uh, into Oakland out to Oak Knoll Navy Hospital, which at that time is closed now. But at that time it was out MacArthur Boulevard, way out in the east part of Oakland. And uh, they took us there and it was, it was getting, beginning to get daylight when we got to the hospital. They took us into rooms, and uh, the, the corpsman working there, I had been stationed there for a time before, so the corpsman had brought around this tray full of little shots of whiskey. <laughs> and, I knew it. and he gave us, we each grabbed one, drank that real quick. He started to walk away, and I said, wait a minute, Lane, come back. Don't go away with that tray. So we just about emptied this tray. <laughs> they had plenty more. They had plenty more. They weren't going to run out. We stayed there about a week, possibly two weeks. And, um, and we, we, we were sent back over to the Treasure Island to a way to reassign it. They, I'm not sure how long it took for the to get that reassignment. But my buddy Horton was transferred into the Marine Corps from there and became a, a, a Marine Corpsman sent to Korea. And uh, I don't know if you may not know it, but Marine Corpsman or Navy Corpsman transferred into the Marines. 
the Marines don't train corporal Navy. That's it. And I was I was assigned to another ship down in uh, home port San Diego. I served on that ship till I got out of the Navy. But of those of the people on board the ship when she sank, uh, we lost 23 out of a, a total of 505 people. We had no patients on board because we had not put it really into commission yet. We had no patients, so that was a very lucky move. If we had had patients, it would have been a whole different story from the one I just told. But we, we made it with, and of the medical staff, there was one, one nurse boss, one of the 15 nurses. Wilma Ledbetter was her name, Lieutenant Senior Grade. And she didn't die in the water. She, she was pulled up onto a boat. And after she was on the boat, she had a heart attack and died. And they had no real medical help there at that time. So nobody knows whether she might have made it with help, but she did not make it. The uh, following, this was on a Friday, this all happened on a Friday, 25th. On Monday, uh, they had a memorial service for a moment that better at the Oak Knoll, at the chapel at Oak Knoll Navy Hospital. Uh, one of the nurses from the ship uh, attended her body, took her, uh, escorted her back to Chillicothe, Texas, where she was buried next to her parents. <coughs> and there was one other nurse that I, I had a, a little information about her time after that. Uh, she married a Navy chaplain shortly after, after that. They spent the rest of their Navy career here and there, all over. And she died in 1956 and was buried in uh, Culver City, Oklahoma. And uh, that was along with her parents and so on. Uh, and her, her husband didn't do it. Her husband had actually died just before, a couple of years before she did. So they, they, they were both gone at that time. And uh, John Angelo Napoli was never, as I said, he was never able to work again as a fisherman. He did odd jobs around the waterfront of San Francisco. And in uh, 1975, he died and was buried at Terra Linda. Just right here. And that's, that was the last time I knew about him uh, closely related. Now, jump ahead 55 years, 2005. My wife Caroline and I were at a wedding in Bodega Bay. One of the bridesmaids in that wedding party had the last name of Napoli. Well, my wife couldn't wait until the ceremony was over, and she went and found this Miss Napoli and brought her and introduced her to me. And I, uh, we were talking, there were so many interruptions, there was music playing. So we decided we would dance and we could talk about her ancestry. We danced and we talked and we danced and we talked the rest of the evening. And she, she knew her parents, of course. Her father was, was another John Angelo Napoli. Her grandfather was John Angelo Napoli II. And her great-grandfather, who she had never known, he died before she was born, was John Angelo Napoli I. And his wife, her great-grandmother's name, was Flora. F-L-O-R-A. The name of that boat that picked us up out of that ice water that night back in, 19, in 1945. Excuse me. It was 1950. Uh, the name of this boat was the Flora. So I believe then, and I still believe today, that I had the privilege of dancing 
with John Angelo Napoli's great granddaughter. strap down between his legs and up and fastened so that the life jacket stayed down. Those of us who have done the safety at sea lessons and all and <laughs> jumped into water know what it's like when you don't have that strap on because suddenly the life jacket's up here and you're down in the water. Anyway, you saw the picture of the nurses wearing their regulation Navy uniforms. Three-quarter length skirt. They wore the same life jacket that the man that Horton and Carlin went back to rescue. Just think about that for a second in the crotch strap. Uh, at least the sail of the man had pants on to a little protection from the water, but the nurses who were in the water uh, were essentially naked from the waist out for all of the time that they were in the water. They had, the nurses, by the way, had been given one hour of safety training. They, they, the way it worked, and the, the nurses were only, could only enlist in the Navy after they were nurses, and they did not go through basic training as regular sailors did. They were, they were not designed, you know, they were not supposed to be regular sailors, so they were given uh, medical training uh, and one hour of, uh, one hour of safety. Training in, in, their, uh, in their days. Okay, well, I'm sorry I ran a little long. That's our story about the ghost fleet. So the next time you sail by Point San Pablo, the next time you, you walk in downtown San Francisco, or the next time you sail to Half Moon Bay or further south, think about the fact that you are passing by, passing over ships which have been there, uh, some of them for 150 years. Uh, others for a little shorter time, and will remain there. Uh, by the way, benevolence was a wash, as you saw in those pictures. It did not, it was, uh, it was, it sank in about 75 feet of water, and it was about 73 uh, feet wide. Uh, and the next year, after several tugs had hit it, and fishermen complained, uh, the Navy contracted with a private contractor who uh, put in 140,000 pounds of explosive, and detonated it and just threw the ship up into small pieces. Uh, it's, a, it's a grave site, as the Conestoga is a grave site, because of the 23 that died on benevolence, they did not recover all of the bodies. So the assumption is that they were trapped in the hull and uh, were, are still there uh, as, as of today. So it's a, it's a sobering thought to think that there's that kind of a of a occurrence so close to where we sail a lot of the time. So I want to thank you for inviting us again. Uh, and uh, you know, there are questions about any time. There must be questions. No question. Probably the big question is why did they go over the other? I was wondering if the Navy uh, compensated Mr. Nicole for saving. Uh, I, I'll speak for Garland. Uh, yes, uh, Polly was compensated uh, by the Navy and uh, I think by the Luckenbach Company. Is that right? Yeah, yeah he was compensated for his, uh, the, the, the ship, the, 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 the uh, fishing boat was, uh, was broken up after this incident was so badly damaged by the uh, slamming against the London back home. And as Carlin said, he was he, he 
did something to his shoulder, which did not allow him to uh, fully use his arms at that. Is there another question? Yes. Are there any traderships? Well, no, not not really. The, there there are several stories, but but uh, there are um, so far as I know in my research, there are, there's nothing salvageable of, of enough value to go after it. Uh, the gold, remember, was leaving here going south. Uh, and uh, any gold that might have been lost on its way from San Francisco down to Panama Isthmus and across by Mule and up the other coast would have been lost you know, down down there, so I don't know. Yes? I just wanted to know what those life jackets were like back 70 years what, what were the life jackets like? Yeah, um, they well, the, the Type 1 life jacket today is similar. It's that big orange thing that is full of foam. It comes up like this only in the day. Instead of foam, they used a uh, cake ball, uh, which was uh, a bar. Excuse me, Those life jackets, they were filled with something soft. Yeah. 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 On the Netherlands, there had been no lipo drill. Uh, part of the a certain number of the people on board were civilian engineers from Mare Island who were there on board to make sure the machinery that they had put back into shape was working correctly. Uh, the uh, captain who was scheduled to take over the next day when they left for um, Korea was on board and he died in the sinking because he went back into the ship to try to rescue uh, people who uh, had not gotten out and he himself was trapped in the, in the sinking. Um, the Luckenbach was repaired and went back into service. Uh, both ships had radar but neither ship's radar <coughs> was functioning correctly. Um, when they, when they hit. Uh, Benevolence was one of, of five, I believe, uh, cargo ships that had been converted right at the end of the war into a hospital ship when uh, the invasion of the Japanese mainland was being planned. And it was assumed, given the experience on Okinawa and Iwo Jima, that we could expect about one million casualties uh, in that, in, during that invasion. So they quickly converted these uh, transport ships to, to hospital ships. The, the, the regular hospital ship had a double hull, had watertight compartments, and was essentially a warship painted white. But these were freighters uh, converted and painted white. So that, as Marlon suggested, when the Luckenbach's bow encountered the port side of the Benevolence had just, just ripped a gash down, and there was nothing behind the gash <coughs> except the uh, interior of the hull. Okay, is that it? Thank you very much for coming tonight. I think tonight illustrates how much we all can appreciate history when we slow down and think about it. And I want to give a special thanks to Patrick, and please give another hand to Garland. We are so happy to hear your story and hear it from you. That was incredible. I don't think any of us will forget it. Thank you. Good night.